French Revolution. That's very, very interesting. And I think maybe to extend this uh, conversation about democracy and the constitution, etc., um, I'd like us to talk a bit about Hayek's The Constitution of Liberty, um, because I also think in keeping with the uh, tabs on uh, government being placed, I think Hayek also does a pretty a good job and uh, laying out the case for why that has to be the case. Um, and in the previous two podcasts, uh, the links to which we'll, uh, we'll make sure to be attached in the descriptor of this video, uh, we spoke a lot about Hayek and Keynes and the quarrel that they have. And I remember one particular um, uh, discussion we had um, about Keynes's critique of uh, Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. Um, so wh what I did after that conversation is I went back and I read uh, that part of the road to serfdom that Keynes critiqued. And, and it was a very interesting critique um, because even then um, my view of Keynes radically changed because some of the books that I had read had painted Keynes in a very, very unfavorable light. Um, but after taking him a lot more seriously than I had before, I took the criticism a lot more seriously. Um, and it turns out that what, uh, one of the things that he was criticizing was Hayek's um, concession um, to the government taking over certain um, uh, parts of the economy, one of which was transport, of course. Uh, and what Keynes says, I think quite brilliantly, is you, you, you to Hayek, he, he says this, um, you make a pretty good case for, um, uh, you know, keeping the state limited uh, because you obviously fear the slippery uh, uh, the, the slippery sl slide uh, and you of course fear what you call in the title the road to serfdom. Um, but what you don't see is that your own arguments as well will eventually lead to this road to serfdom that you yourself are so fearful of. And one of the uh, points that he used as an example was that concession that Hayek made in uh, the road to serfdom about the government potentially taking over public transportation. And I think uh, the constitution of liberty was Hayek's attempt to deal, among other things, with that criticism by Keynes. Um, firstly, w w w what do you make of that assessment? Uh, and secondly, do you think that Hayek succeeded um, at uh, you know tying up the loose ends, so to speak, of the road to serfdom. So I think you give the intellectual history for the Constitution of Liberty exactly correctly. By the way, the criticism by Keynes stung um, Hayek tremendously because it is a very powerful point. He says, you, Hayek, also reserve a place for planning in your economy. But apparently you think if anybody else talks about planning, it's the road to serfdom. And so, in fact, Hayek actually stopped, stepped away from being an economist for a substantial period of time and devoted himself to the study of both law and philosophy to try to grapple with this question of uh, how do we justify some areas of planning in society, yeah. like constitutions, <laughs> like law courts, and so on. And uh, and that is what led, in fact, to the Constitution of Liberty. So, so you tell the story exactly correctly. Um, I, I just want to read um, to our listeners one sentence from a letter by Keynes to Hayek about the road to serfdom, which is resonant with the discussion that we've had this afternoon. Um, because he says, look, actually, I like your book a lot. It's just that we have small, one small disagreement. He says, and here's what Keynes writes. He says, what we want is not no planning or even less planning. Indeed, I should say that we almost certainly want more planning. Now, this disagreement was caused by Keynes rejecting the assumption of divergent ends in, in Hayek. Um, the argument was, as Keynes later said, that um, he could address this with what he called right moral thinking. So, since he, and quoting Keynes again, he said, dangerous acts, like planning at the society level, can be done safely in the community which thinks and feels rightly, which would be the way to hell if they were executed by those who think and feel wrongly. Mm. Now this, so this is going to be, this, is, this will lead me to the constitution of liberty. Um, Keynes relies on right moral thinking to temper the dangers of planning. Hayek says that is an, a, a terrible starting point because he also believes like Smith, that though we have good moral intuitions, we are profoundly limited in our insight, and especially at our in, uh, on our insight at the social at the level of the total society. So we have what he calls kind of local knowledge. Um, in our own lives, we know the circumstances best. I know very little about the current circumstances, for example, in Pretoria. Um, so it would be very difficult for me to make any sensible plan for the good citizens of Pretoria. But 
I know much more about Dalsa here in Stellenbosch. Now, the Constitution of Liberty provides a different answer. Instead of right moral thinking, it says, now what we want is a set of rules that will allow each of us to work with the local knowledge that we have, and then for me and you to collaborate where our local knowledge overlaps with each other. So we can, so a, a, an order of collaboration between us can emerge if there is st enough stability in our society given by a set of basic principles that we can use to guide our collaboration. Something like property rights, for example, would be an example of it. Uh, reliable courts is another part of it. So also the fact that, that and this is where the role for government comes in, if, if government provides enough, enough external security for the society, then you and I can plan for a, 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 a two, three, ten year collaboration. If they didn't provide that, then you and I would first have to talk about building a private army to secure our enterprise. Yeah. Um, so, so his answer is, if we can agree on a set of basic principles for the society, then we can exercise our liberty, our individual co cooperation with local knowledge. So that's why he says our liberty is a constituted liberty. Mm -hmm. He's not an anarchist. He's not a market anarchist that says, just leave me alone and I'll... He says, in fact, if you leave me alone with no framework, I can't function as, yeah. a, as a market participant. Mm. The market itself requires a set of basic rules like a stable monetary system, property rights, and so on. These, these I've already mentioned. Um, so for, for Hayek, liberty is itself the outcome of a series of, uh, of institutional design in society. Um, and if you don't live in that kind of society, you are unfree. So your liberty is not just a, a, a philosophical fact. It is what he calls a constituted fact. It emerges as part of the social order in the right kind of society, in what Popper would have called an open society. Yeah, and that strikes me as very convincing and very, very reasonable. But of course, Keynes uh, wasn't the only um, uh, critic of uh, Hayek's slippery yeah. road to serfdom. Um, he has uh, critics from the same camp, uh, if you will, the same libertarian camp, one of whom, and perhaps foremost of whom is Ayn Rand, um, who said of Hayek that he is, quote, so saturated in the bromides of collectivism that it is terrifying, which I think is a extreme exaggeration of the story. Um, but, but I can understand, like, I understand where she's coming from. I mean, Hayek is making some concessions, and she allegedly said this in the Montpellerin Society, if I'm not mistaken. Mises right. himself yeah. uh, had uh, shared very similar sentiments to Ayn Rand. Um, he, he in, in fact, there's a very interesting story told by Milton Friedman of um, Mises at the Montpellerin Society shouting at an audience that had Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek, um, George Stigler, among other people, and calling all of them statists, which is very, very, very shocking to me. Um, uh, but, but I understand. It's because they are willing to make compromises that people like von Mises and Ayn Rand are not willing to make. Um, and Correct. And, th and it's th the crucial point is that they see those as compromises. So, so they are really extreme um, libertarians. They, they are approaching the sort of anarchic end of uh, libertarians, in fact, there's a term for it called anarcho-capitalism, <laughs> and that's, that's where you find Rand as well. And um, The reason they are so upset with Friedman and, and Hayek and uh, Stigler is for the same reason that Marx was so upset with the democratic socialists, mm. who was sympathetic to a big part of his agenda, but not in the extreme end where he finds himself. So you hate those who are almost you sometimes more. Sure. Um, she calls Hayek the most pernicious enemy sure. of libertarians because he is so persuasive as a libertarian but doesn't share her full agenda. Mm -hmm. Now, I think um, as an economist that she is in fact simply wrong, <laughs> um, that, that, that she misunderstands the market order because she fails to see the market order as an emergent order and she fails to grapple with the emergent order as one that has correctly, as Hayek says, areas of planning in it. Mm. So there's an emergent order is not an anarchic order. It is often an order with some structure in it, 
And that structure can be given in what Hayek calls areas of planning. And those areas of planning are themselves subject to change over time. So he's not a conservative. So remember, he ends the Constitution of Liberty with a chapter in which he explains why he's not a conservative. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't say when he says, I'm, I'm, I have room for a government that provides the external security of the state. He's not Burke who says... Uh, we have that because it has been our tradition for a thousand years. To assign, Burke, no. Yeah, that's right. That's Edmund Burke, the, okay. the, the uh, great opponent of the French Revolution in Britain in the late 18th century, mm. um, whose argument, he's, he's the most eloquent of the conservative voices of that era. He says, no, look, you know, we've, we've actually tried, we have tried and tested institutions. Don't tinker with things, something that isn't broken. Yeah. Um, Hayek says that's not his position at all. Yeah. His argument for or um, maintaining the central bank or the army or the police force is not because we, it existed last week or 50 years ago. We tested in the open society against, our, against the, the, the contribution that it makes, and it, and it may well be the case that we wanted this area of planning in a particular era. And then, for, for example for reasons of technological development, 50 years later we decide that it's no longer required to be a central area of planning. Right. Um, we have many examples of goods that we thought were public goods that became privately provided. So the market used to fail until we've got a certain development uh, in technology or in, uh, or in business practice. And now as a private service we can provide this. Broadcasting is a nice example of it. We used to think that radio broadcasting, television broadcasting was so prohibitively expensive that the structure could only be put in place by the government on behalf of society. Mm -hmm. That argument was persuasive in the 1920s. It's completely unpersuasive in the 2020s. Yeah. Now we know, in fact, that the least efficient and the poorest of, the, uh, of these services, with the, with the one unique exception of the BBC, mm -hmm. are the collectivist ones. Um, all the uh, and and we can provide radio stations, television stations, completely through the workings of uh, of the market mechanism through the emergent order. And Hayek would take that argument completely on board. So he he's not committed to a configuration of institutions, but he says this emergent order at any point in time will have areas of planning. And we know it's true. Even Rand knows it's true. I'm 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 astonished by her purism in this area. Mm -hmm when she's at the same time an apologist for corporations, for example. Now, corporations are not internal markets. The arrangement of resources within a company is not negotiated every day as if in a market. It is an area of planning. Mm -hmm. it, it is, by the way, one of the great intellectual challenges to economics in the 20th century to explain the existence of companies. Because at the same time we say the market does best, but who's in the market? It's not little markets called companies. Yeah. It's areas of planning. So how do we explain the existence of companies, sometimes quite large companies, if we think that planning is so inefficient? And, and so Hayek provides a much better intellectual grasp on that, on the reason for the existence of areas of planning, as well as an explanation of why these areas of planning don't always last. Um, these areas of planning's planning is superseded by a more efficient version down the line, which is why the same corporation that's dominant today is not the one that was dominant 70 years ago or 100 years ago. In fact, none of the great corporations of the late 19th century are today one of the world's great corporations, not a single one of them. Um, they've all been superseded, and that would not have surprised Hayek. Sure, that's very interesting. Um, and all of this reminds me of Margaret Thatcher's response uh, to being stopped by a journalist, uh, pulling out of her handbag a copy of the Constitution of Liberty, holding it aloft and declaring that this is what we believe. Right. Um, because, it, like, uh, I mean, it, it's also worthwhile mentioning that these aren't fringe ideas. Like, Hayek isn't right. a fringe author. Like, right. he influenced some po like powerhouses of, you know, um, uh, politics right around the world. Uh, it's obviously not just Margaret Thatcher. She's perhaps foremost among them. But he's been a huge, huge influence um, on yeah. mainstream politics and economics. It is true, but he went through a real yeah. dip. Um, when he won the Nobel Prize in 1974, now we think very wisely <laughs> by, the, by the committee to have awarded him the prize because 
in the with the benefit of hindsight, we now know that he's one of the true giants of the 20th century in terms of economic and social thinking more broadly. Mm. But at the time when they did that, they were so embarrassed by giving it to him that they split the prize with mm. one of his great ideological opponents to kind of water it down. So they really split, but it wasn't that they shared the prize. There's no sense in which Myrdal and Hayek could share anything. Yeah. They are diametrically opposed. And in fact, Myrdal was so scandalized by sharing the prize with Hayek that he, he actually said, perhaps we should stop handing out this prize altogether. Yeah, I read his speech, um, actually. Shocking. So he was, he was deeply offended by sharing the prize with, uh, with Hayek. Now, today, nobody reads Myrdal. I can tell you, it is he, Myrdal has become has become simply furniture in the economic in the sort of landscape of economic history. Sure. Whereas Hayek is a is an important part of modern thinking in economics and in and in social thinking more broadly. Um, so so history has has given us a verdict on the relative importance of Myrdal and Hayek. But at the time, it seemed very different. Um, Hayek's Nobel acceptance speech itself tells you the story that we've been speaking about this afternoon. He says we should approach society like a gardener. So that doesn't mean we don't do anything. We're not ran. We don't just stand back and look at the flowers. We're a gardener. We prune. We dig. We plant. We water. But what we don't do is to determine the outcome. Mm -hmm. The outcome is an emergent outcome from the garden. We are involved. We are a part of it. But we have limited knowledge. And with that limited knowledge, we grapple towards it and we, and we respond to feedback um, as, we, as we see mistakes being made in the garden. So, so it's an organic approach to society in which we realize that the, the total outcome is not the intention of any one of the participants in the system. I mean, Prof, we could go on speaking like this forever and ever and ever. Like, I, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. I mean, it hasn't been too much work. I've just sat here and enjoyed the conversation because it really has been hugely, hugely enjoyable. Um, and I think uh, maybe to also thank you for just the opportunity to have prepared for this, uh, uh, for this conversation. You know, obviously you going out of your way to buy me the books, uh, some of which we have discussed in the podcast today. I mean, it's truly, truly humbling uh, experience to have received um, uh, so such a you know a, a present from you, and I would really love to get your signature on it. By the way, um, but I mean it's been such an enjoyable conversation. I mean your passion for education is palpable, and it's on display for everybody to see or hear. In our case, um, and I just really want to thank you. And I mean, I mean, your education goes beyond your students in a university class. I mean you've educated even those of us who have not been formal students of yours in a in a in a, in a lecture hall or in a university setting. And I mean, to that, I just want to say, um, long may it continue. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You're very kind, Pilar. It's a great pleasure. There's nothing um, more enjoyable to, than to share these ideas. We are all students together. And uh, that is what Popper wanted us to do, is to, is to try to grapple together to a better understanding. And, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you very much. No, it's an absolute pleasure, Prof. Do you by any chance have any final words for our listeners? Um, no. Uh, apart from asking them to go and read some of the stuff that we've discussed this afternoon, yeah, I think engaging directly with the primary authors is mm. always the right thing to do. Uh, don't assume that a book is too famous to read. Um, uh, they're very, they're very accessible um, these days on Kindle. They're ludicrously accessible. Yeah. Uh, so get yourself a copy. We've spoken about the Notes from Underground, the Constitution of Liberty, the Open Society, and its enemies. Uh, that's a brilliant start. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and maybe just a note to, a note to the listeners. Uh, we are still a non-profitable organization and can only continue to uh, exist with your support. Uh, and if you enjoyed today's conversation and wish to hear more of these conversations, please do head on over to our website at nmonline.co.za. Uh, the website will guide you from there. Just click on the support option and you'll see all the options on there. Uh, we still do not run any ads on the podcast and so these podcasts are made possible entirely through your support so if you really enjoyed today's conversation please do share the conversation and please do support us if you see fit to do so uh prof stan what an absolutely great conversation and i had no doubt it was going to be amazing from the very beginning and it's lived up to my expectations and exceeded them thank you so much thank you pila it's been fun let's do it again for sure